Hey everyone, I am live and I am trying to make sure that this post is working. Um, so I am going to use my phone this time um, because last time I used the computer and I ended up getting this weird double, um, double, 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 double. <laughs> I was trying to talk and I would hear myself talking. It was very, very strange. So. Um, what I'm looking for, okay, I think I think we're going. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to talk and I would hear myself talking. It was very, very strange. Okay. So it looks like we are good to go as far as um, my phone work, or showing me that this post is live on Patreon, which is really the only thing that's bugging me about this whole situation is when you are broadcasting through YouTube. It takes you to Google Hangouts, which then broadcasts to the Patreon post. It's really annoying because I can't tell if it's coming through on Patreon unless I go to Patreon and then I get that, you know, that weird delay. Um, I also can't tell if anybody's commenting because in the Google Hangout, I can see there's a chat message link here, but when I'm here on the uh, post, it's uh, I can't see if anybody's making a comment. So I'm gonna play around a little bit more with these live streams, and I might give um, I might see what other options are available. I've been using YouTube, um, and it's kind of been working out, but I also think that possibly. Um, one of the uh, there's there's the option for YouTube and then there's another video live stream option. I might look into that. Um, the only thing is that it costs money, and I am all about using the free services. <laughs> However, if the free services aren't working, then I want to make sure that patrons have an opportunity to to get you know as as good of an experience as they can. So I'm killing time until it's 10.30. Like I said, I wanted to set this up a little bit early today so that I didn't have what was happening last uh, month where I was trying to talk and set things up and get going. And it was about 15 minutes after the start time before we were actually able to start. So now it's about three minutes before the start time. Anyway, I'd rather be early than late. Um, that's where I am. So... Uh, I've prepared a couple of things today. Um, I have my Ladybug coffee mug, which is excellent. Hang on. This is very good. Actually, that coffee is nasty because this morning I went to mail some things and I thought the post office opened at 8. Apparently it opens at 9. What the heck? I don't know. So I was uh, enjoying the coffee. I left my coffee here instead of bringing some with me and that was very sad. Um, I have my, so I have my bullet journal, um, and this bullet journal is, ah, I dropped my pencil. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Um, so this is kind of how I keep my, oh, this is going to be some bonus content. This is kind of how I keep myself organized. So you can see, like, here's April. And, oh, I see I've got a mirror effect going on. So April, I basically write the dates down on the side. And then if there's anything going on on that date that I have to be aware of, I'll put it there. So like, for instance, we had um, uh, Easter. Um, I'm transitioning from one of my part-time jobs. So I put that on there. And then each day I write out my to-do list. And I've started doing, like, on Monday, I'll write, like, a weekly list of all the things that I want to get done, however many thousand words I want to get written, um, if I've got any editing or critiques going on, any tasks that I have to do for my Army Reserve unit. And then I just put them up, and then day by day, I break out the things that I'm going to do. So for instance, this is like my long list for this week. And adding to this list, um, you know, there's there's a bunch of different stuff. Stuff comes up every day. But, um, and I haven't done this yet, but breaking out Tuesday. So like for today, um, doing this live stream. Um, I also have a critique that I owe to a friend of mine who's writing a web drama. And I have to actually write up my notes and send them to her. 
Um, I also have a short story that I like to finish up and I've got a couple, um, I want to get a couple hundred words, maybe a thousand words done on winter run today. So all of those things are going on, but yes, trying to make sure that I'm getting more stuff done by tracking the things that need to get done. And then I remember them because they're written down. Anyway, that's my bullet journal. And the reason that I have this here is as I'm going through the live stream, if people have questions, if they want to post a question, if there's a, I don't know if there's just an opportunity to go ahead and um, like if something occurs to me or whatever, I'll put it out there and see. So like I said, I'm seeing a Google Hangout picture that I don't quite know how to get to the Patreon um, platform. However, I do see if people write a comment on the Patreon site. So if you guys have questions, and I think when I say you guys, there's like maybe one or two people watching, but in the future, if you guys have questions, feel free to leave a comment, leave a question. Um, even if you're are coming to this live stream months from now, that question will still pop up and chances are it'll still be relevant. So I'll try to address it. So I've got a couple of things with me today to talk about beginnings, which I've been, like I said, I was doing some critiquing and editing this week. Uh, I had one story that is going to a writer punk anthology. Um, I also had my own story that I got edits back on for that same anthology. Um, I, like I said, I'm critiquing a friend's web drama, which um, is being currently produced and we're about to head into rehearsals for that. Um, and I also am working on an announcement for a personal project that I've been working on putting together um, kind of behind the scenes. And I'll talk more about that later, but that is also taking some of my editing time. Um, the, the <laughs> The things that are really, it's really interesting, the perspective that you can get when you are editing and critiquing as opposed to writing. Because when you're writing, obviously it's, it's good to get experience doing that. So, um, you know, that's why people say you should write every day or, you know, I say write, you know, when you can, <laughs> because writing every day is, is a lofty goal that I don't often achieve. Um, but critiquing and especially critiquing other people's stuff is really is a really important exercise for writers. And the reason for this is that sometimes we're a little bit blind to our own writing and we have to figure out how to get better at self-editing. Um, and, and this can be done. And so reading other people's work is one of the first steps to beginning to recognize common, um, common themes and common issues that people have. And the, the more you can improve at editing and critiquing, the more you can improve at self-editing and critiquing. And so that when um, you're going to query or submit your work, it will be, you'll have a, a, the ability to produce at a higher quality. Um, this is especially important for writers who maybe don't have a local critique group or who have a local critique group but have been in it for a while. And so even though the people in that group are giving you really great feedback, um, you all know each other pretty well by now and you all know each other's writing pretty well by now. And so sometimes when you get as familiar with somebody else's writing as you do with your own, the same sort of issues start to crop up, namely being eye blind to some of the common um, issues of style. So here's a couple of techniques for looking at the beginning of your story. And like I said, when you're editing and critiquing, this can be one of the first places that it's helpful to turn an eye to. Um, beginning a story is challenging because be until you've actually finished the story or the novella or the novel or even the nonfiction book, it can be a little bit difficult to figure out if you're indeed starting in the right place. Um, I wrote a flash fiction piece for one of my MFA um, stories, MFA classes. <laughs> And it was like 900 words. And you would think with 900 words, knowing where to start wouldn't be as big of a deal. But I workshopped that with a couple of people that were more familiar with the YA genre than I was. And 
I got feedback saying, you should start this here. And they pointed out a place like halfway down the story, like this has to be 900 words and you just cut half of them. <laughs> so, but it, they were right. They were absolutely right. Um, and especially in flash fiction, and we're gonna come back to this, can be really kind of difficult to um, cram an entire story into a thousand words, but it can be done and starting in the right place makes that happen. Um, I have a, a book that I started uh, that I'm, that's currently out uh, for I'm querying it out to a couple of different places. And I thought, oh, I'll start at this place. So basically the entire book is about a woman who is a blues guitar player and an army veteran. And that's, she's living the life that she loves. She gets to play music. She travels around in her beat up station wagon with her basset hound, Frank. And she plays music for a living and she doesn't have a lot of obligations and she really likes it like that. However, um, the fairy world has a few other ideas of how she should be living her life. And so they basically take her out of her comfortable life and force her to help them. And when I first started the book, I thought, oh, you know what? I'll start with an inciting incident where she meets the Fae. Right? That makes sense because it's a speculative fiction, urban fantasy genre. You got to get people right into the world. You have to introduce them to the speculative elements right up front. And I want to get that, that hook. So um, I started off with a, a rainstorm and she's driving this old crappy station wagon. So she has to stop because she can't see how her windshield wipers are pretty dead. Um, because being a blues guitarist is a fun job, but it's not one that pays very well. So she hasn't repaired her car in a while. So she's sitting under this bridge and she's playing guitar and she's watching the rain. And then she sees a fae run by. The first draft of the novel and even the second draft of the novel, this opening scene stayed exactly the way it was. And then I did an edit to look at theme. And I was like, okay, what is the big you know, how do I, how do I communicate what this character wants and what she needs and, you know, what she's forced to do? And I realized that my opening scene actually didn't have very much of a hook and it didn't have much of an inciting incident because the entire book is about this, this musician, um, Lynn Rose and no, Rose Allen Lee, sorry, I'm mixing up my protagonists. So Rose Allen Lee and it's all about her trying to first reclaim her old life. Like she doesn't want to do with the Fae because they're, they're Fae, you know? Um, and then she wants to um, get them out of her life. And then when she accepts that, you know, okay, they're, they're here to stay, she has to basically figure out how to do this, how to, how to make sure that she doesn't, you know, die <laughs> or get lost in the fairy world forever. You know, there's all kinds of great things that could happen. And I was like, all right, well, how do I open the, book with an incident that will illustrate this. And so instead of opening with her just kind of in a static position, not doing anything, I was like, what if the Fae jump out in front of her car in the rainstorm? And so she's forced to, you know, run, basically run off the road. And that's more of a, of a, of an image of what the Fae are going to do to her life. They're basically jumping out in front of her and she's forced to react and almost crash her car. And then um, she gets out to see if there's any damage and they start throwing rocks at her. I'm like, that's basically the entire book <laughs> right there. And that opening scene, that's when I started getting um, less rejection, <laughs> shall we say. Um, the book is currently, being, like I said, it's being queried out. Um, and hopefully somebody will like it. We'll see. But talking about beginnings, that was a beginning that definitely came about, even though I was almost there in the writing stages, that came about in the editing and revision stage. So how do you get there? All right. So I got a couple of books today that I'm going to share. Um, the first one here is called uh, Damn Fine Story. Again, I'm getting this weird mirror effect. It's called Damn Fine Story. It's by Chuck Wendig. I recommend this book to basically everybody who wants to write because it is fun. It's an easy read. 
and it basically distills everything that you need to know about writing. And it's got a great hook. Let me, oh, fine. Okay. So nonfiction books are also going to have a hook, right? So if you're writing a memoir, you want you want the reader to have a reason to keep reading. Um, if you're reading, if you're writing a nonfiction book, especially narrative nonfiction, where it's not going to be a textbook, you need you still need people to want to keep going after the first page. So in this book about writing books, um, the author writes, "My father never read a book. At least I never saw him read one. He had books on his shelves, mostly books about cowboys and a lot of books about guns, but that was it." He never read a book, but he always told stories. Okay, so that introduction leads me to believe that uh, first, uh, it gives you an idea of the style of the book. It's going to be very personal, personable, both. It's going to lead us through uh, a couple of different things, but it's going to not necessarily be just about writing per se, but about this larger theme called storytelling and it is like I said this this book is really good um, and it talks about character it talks about a bunch of different things but when it comes to designing scenes and especially designing the the plot of the book there's a section in here on different plots and different arcs that you can look at different models I should say that you can look at uh, the first one or the one that I kind of wanted to talk about is the, um, he says, okay, size, breed, size breeds complexity too. So the larger your story, the more you have to consider exactly how the arrangement will best serve the tale and the audience. At the end of the day, it's still easy enough to break down into three parts. The first part, which is the part we're talking about today, introduction, problem, attack. All right, so like I said, I have uh, an introduction to a problem. And this was actually, reading this section right there is basically how I went back and revised my story. Because I was like, how I'm introducing, in that, that first version of the scene, I was introducing people to the character, but not necessarily to the character's problem and how she was going to attack it. So instead of just having her passively sit there and sort of react, her problem is that there are these creatures, these otherworldly creatures who have an agenda and want to make her part of the agenda. And being who she is, she can't just ignore it, but she reacts to it. And she reacts to it usually physically. Um, she reacts to it aggressively. Um, and so in all of this, I needed to show in the first scene. So I'm not, because we're not, so we're not just introducing characters and we're not just introducing setting. Um, characters and setting, we have an entire book to dive deeply into. So we want, yes, we want to show this at the beginning, obviously, especially if we're writing genre fiction, we need to see the setting so we understand where we are and, and understand which tropes we're going to be hitting. But at the same time, we really, really need to know what is the problem of this character and how how they react to it should be something that's reflected throughout the entire book even if they have to, they are forced to change their avenues of approach through the book. Which, if you think about it, a lot of times when you're reading a work of fiction, the problem that the character has is uh, initially they're reacting to it the same way that they've always reacted to everything. And the dramatic conflict and the tension comes from when their old ways of dealing with something don't necessarily work anymore. I mean, because honestly, let's face it, if a fae jumped out at you and ran you off the road, how are you going to <laughs> react to that? It's going to be a little crazy, right? And be like, oh, great. I mean, if something else jumps out in front of you, there's a certain way that you can react. If it's an animal and if it's large enough and damages your car, you might stop and get out and look at your car. But I mean, what are you going to do? The animal's probably, you know, they've either escaped because they were large enough to damage your car instead of you damaging them, or you know, it's, there's, you know, the, the bunny or whatever is roadkill, which is, you know, also depressing. 
Um, or if something jumps out at you or say you have to slam on the brakes to avoid a kid or a bicycler or a pedestrian who's staring at their phone instead of paying attention to where they're going. Again, there's going to be a prescribed way that you're probably going to deal with that. You're going to jam on the brakes. You might honk your horn. You might, you know, sit there and, and say a bad word. Um, hopefully you've stopped in time, but there's a specific way they're going to deal with that. So for me, I wanted to give my character a situation where it's something happens, it's out of the ordinary, and how she deals with it is going to be how she basically deals with it through the first part of the book until she starts kind of accepting that her life isn't normal anymore. So um, Chuck Wendig, that damn fine story. Um, take a look at that chapter, take a look at how he approaches all of these things. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at Chuck Wendig's introduction um, uh, problem and attack. And then we're gonna come into this book called Story Grid by Sean Coyne, right there. And this book is, like I said, like I said earlier, we're attacking this more from an editing perspective and a revision perspective, um, because this is how we can get better. And the one of the things that he talks about beginning the story is distilling the story into hook, build, and payoff. So your hook is what grabs the reader's attention. It's the the thing that happens that's out of the ordinary. It's the problem that needs to be solved. It's the hint at conflict. It's the hint at tension. Sometimes it's not a hint. Sometimes it's straight up out there. Um, it's telling us that this is a book about writing, but it's going to be not just about books. It's going to be about stories overall. Okay. You know, so that, that's what gets us in. That's what encourages us to keep turning the page. Then you have the build. And this is, this can be the middle of the book. This can be the middle of the scene. This can be the middle of the, of the paragraph, but the build is what are, is the problems that you're throwing at your character in a more and more complicated fashion. It's where we're going to try plan A, plan B, plan C, plan C1, plan C2, plan C3, as many things as, as needed um, until we get to the payoff, which is, you know, where either the character solves their problems, um, they defeat the big bad. If it's a tragedy, their fatal flaw causes them to um, have a really terrible ending where everybody dies. Hello, Hamlet. Um, you know, there, there's all this kind of, of stuff going on. And like I said, we're, we're, pro we're talking about beginnings here. So even in your first chapter, um, you're going to want to try to stick with this, uh, with this hook build payoff with this intro problem attack. So, like I said, for my book, for Steel Toad Blues, my hook is that the main character almost gets run off the road, but not by any sort of normal thing, but by this supernatural creature. Her problem is now that she's stalled on the side of the road, and she she's getting out because that's what you do. You get out to, to see what happened, to, to make sure everybody's all right. And instead of the normal things happening, the creature that she that just ran out in front of her starts throwing rocks at her. And so her solution to this is to chase after the creature. And um, eventually the payoff for the end of the chapter is that the Fae throw, basically throw a tornado at her. And so she um, runs back to the car where she's hiding under, again, under the underpass um, with her dog, who later becomes more important in the story. Um, and so the payoff is that they get her attention and then basically um, say, okay, now that we've got your attention, we'll be in touch. <laughs> so all, like I said, this, again, this is a process that happened during the editing phase, but it also happened because I took a look at some of these um, ways to structure your first scene and, and we're and figuring out where to start. I also had some really good feedback from my writers groups about, hey, this is the place in the story that I actually got into the writing. 
Um, and so this is something, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm working on editing some short stories for a personal project. And one of the stories that I was editing, um, it, was, it was very similar to other ones where the first couple of pages were really rough. But when I got around to page three or four, it was as if the author had suddenly gotten comfortable with their story and all of a sudden the dialogue was flowing and the interactions were interesting and engaging. The problems became clear. The way that the characters were reacting to the problems was consistent. Um, and the author stopped feeling the need to explain every single thing that was happening. I'm like, oh, okay, this is where the author just like, again, stopped trying and just started writing, which is very, very, um, helpful. All right, I'm, I've got one more book that I'm going to recommend to people before I look at three opening paragraphs slash pages. Um, and this is called The First Five Pages by Noah Lukeman. It's a little bit of an older book, but it is still extremely valid. Um, if you can find a copy of this book, do it. Absolutely. Um, he worked as an agent and a lot of the things that he talks about in the book are still extremely um, important to know when you're querying, especially if you're doing traditional publishing. The, the, it is a cliche that um, a lot of beginnings that authors use or newbie authors use are your your character waking up in the morning? If uh, I'm I'm currently in an MFA class, and about half of the opening scenes that we were just writing um, was either someone waking up, or it was like a flash forward sequence, and then they came back to the past, um, or it was some some other way that it felt like the writing was still waiting to begin. And some of it was really well done. Like in one case, the character woke up and was buried alive. I was like, well, that's a really good one, but it still took like five pages to where I felt like the author finally felt comfortable to move the story forward. Um, and it was a really good story too. Once I got into it, like I was like, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to keep reading. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of different, uh, a, a lot of different things ways to beginning a story other than waking up in the morning. So please keep that in mind. Um, but this, um, so in this book, we talk about hook, hook, hook. And this was a pretty important line, I thought. Despite popular misconception though, the hook is more than a marketing tool. At its best, it can be not only a propellant, but also a statement of what you might expect from the text to come. It can establish a character, narrator, or setting, convey a shocking piece of information. The irony is there's only so much you can do with one line, thus it is a game. The less space you have to work with, the more creative you must become. All right, so here's, here's my thoughts about this. If you are having some trouble figuring out where to start, um, this is, this is one of my suggestions. Write, uh, to give yourself a truncated um, word count. So if you're writing a short story, give yourself 300 words to get into it. Say, I'm going to take 300 words and then I'm going to be into the meat of the story. If you are writing a novel, give yourself uh, a flash fiction length story to get you into the novel. So take a look at your first chapter and think to yourself, if I were writing this as a flash fiction, how would I introduce my character and his or her problem in 900 words or less and, and then show how they would attempt to solve that problem? Um, this is a way to basically demonstrate to yourself that a lot of the extra, um, a lot of the extra details about setting and character can be held off until then, until later, or even at all, um, because like I said, most of the time, 
we want to be economical with the information that we give at first. We want to, of course, give our hook. And we want to give that problem and that character. But a lot of times, setting can be inferred with a sentence or two. Um, if you're writing genre fiction, the fact that there are things like tropes um, can really help describe a lot of the setting without you having to go into paragraphs and paragraphs and details. So if you want to set your story on a space station um, and you take maybe a sentence or two and maybe you talk about recycled air or maybe the fact that the station is in the nighttime part of the orbit, immediately your reader, who is probably a science fiction reader, is going to know where they are and start building a picture in their mind. And maybe there's something different about your space station that's um, not the same. So if you talk about recycled air, nighttime side of the orbit, and this is a completely military space station, there's no civilians on it at all. I mean, if you put those details right off the bat, as long as they're integrated into the character's problem that we're hooking people with, people are gonna fill in the blanks for themselves. And so if you're writing a short story, like I said, I challenge you to take 300 words and that's all you get for your, for your beginning, write 300 words. If you're writing a science fiction novel or if you're writing any kind of novel really, give yourself 900 words. For me, um, I like I said, that usually gives me a chance to see to first of all, to make sure that I'm not overwriting my first chapter. And I also later on usually go back and cut those words <laughs> because um, after I've, after I've, even, even if I've completely plotted everything to the point where I'm like, oh, I know exactly what's coming next. And I know exactly what's coming next. A lot of times I'll go back and be like, you know what? There's a better way to start this. Um, and it could be like my YA flash fiction where I cut the first half of it and put more stuff on the end of it so that we're starting a little bit, you know, so we're starting close to the action. Or it could be like Steel Toad Blues where I had the bones of the scene, but in order to make it more relevant to the rest of the book, I made some tweaks here and there to better hook and then better build the character and her um, reactions and her actions so that the entire book would then be consistent with going back to this problem. So um, I am going to go ahead and see. Uh, I've got three books to talk about today or to, to kind of use this as um, an example. One is straight up genre fiction. The second is uh, what we call upmarket fiction. So it's genre, but um, it's kind of like the middle between genre and literary, if that makes sense. Um, and then the last is literary fiction. So I'm just going to open them up. I'm going to read the first paragraph or so and talk about what is going on that we can then maybe use in our own books. So first, and I literally just went to the pile of books that I've been reading through and picked them out. And the first one I have is uh, Mike Cole, his uh, Shadow Ops Control Point. And uh, I love urban fantasy and I especially love military urban fantasy. So um, when I went to a panel at Dragon Con and heard Mike Cole talking about his books, I was like, oh, I gotta check that out. So the very first um, chapter, you open it up and we have this paragraph. They want me to kill a child, Lieutenant Oscar Britton thought. The monitor showed a silent video feed from a high school security camera. On it, a young boy stood in a school auditorium. A long sleeved black t-shirt covered his skinny chest. His hair was a spray of moose and color. He was wreathed in a bright ball of fire. Okay, so right off the bat, we've got some speculative elements. We've got people who are not on fire, but wreathed in fire. And since I know this is urban fantasy, I'm thinking, okay, so apparently there are people who can do magic to include pyromancy. All right, good to know. But 
there's a military character in whose point of view we're in because we open up with his thoughts and somehow his moral dilemma is he needs to shoot this kid. Opening up with that kind of moral dilemma is going to have me reading even, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stop reading this until I, you know, get to the end. Actually, I started reading it and I didn't stop until I got to the end because it's really that good. Um, but we're starting off not just with a description of the world we're in or a description of the character. I mean, that's the character's problem right there is he's faced with this moral dilemma. Does he shoot the kid? And I mean, one of the reasons why we keep reading is to find out exactly why he's supposed to shoot a kid. Does he, um, you know, if he's not able to do it, what kind of effect does that have on him? Because if he's a lieutenant and he's in the military, does he follow his orders? Does he not follow his orders? Um, what are the effects of him going through with it? Or what's the effects of him not going through with it? So there could be injury to his career. Um, there could be what they call moral injury, which um, can result in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it can result in a, actually in a lot of things. So when what kind of world is this where they're sending military people after um, kids to shoot them? So yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on just in that one paragraph that even if a reader doesn't stop and think to themselves all of the things that I just said, it's enough to get them working into a story and, and these, like I said, these questions, even if they're not raising them consciously, they're going to be there in the back of the reader's mind. And so they're going to want to keep reading um, to find out what's going on. Um, and not only that, but asking that sort of a question and having a character who is even asking that question sets up somebody who's sympathetic to the reader because um, not maybe, maybe not because we've all been in a situation where we want to, um, you know, where we've necessarily been in that intense of a moral conflict. Um, but I think we've all had moral conflicts to face in our own life. And so we have sympathy to those who are um, faced with them, even if they're characters in a book of fiction. So definitely. So Mike Cole, Shadow Ops Control Point, where our hook is a moral question, but it's also a straight up action sequence with lots of potentials for harm to everybody, both physical and moral. All right, so the next uh, book, Station Eleven, a novel by Emily St. John Mandel. And again, the mirror effect is showing you it backwards. So this book um, was one that I picked up for an MFA class because the blurb reads, uh, that it's basically a book about a post-apocalyptic Shakespeare troupe. And being someone who likes post-apocalyptic fiction and Shakespeare, I was like, well, that sounds awesome. So the book opens up, here we go, with this scene. The king stood in a pool of blue light on moored. This was act four of King Lear, a winter night at the Elgin Theater in Toronto. Earlier in the evening, three little girls had played a clapping game on stage as the audience entered, childhood versions of Lear's daughters, and now they'd returned as hallucinations in the mad scene. The king stumbled and reached for them as they flitted here and there in the shadows. His name was Arthur Leander. He was 51 years old, and there were flowers in his hair. Dost thou know me? The actor playing Gloucester asked. I remember thine eyes well enough, Arthur said, distracted by the child version of Cordelia, and this was when it happened. There was a change in his face, he stumbled, he reached for a column, but misjudged the distance, and struck it hard with the side of his hand. So in the next like in the next couple of paragraphs on the page, we find out that it happening is the main actor, Arthur, having a heart attack right on the stage. This is a very interesting opening. First of all, we're, we're in the scene, uh, we're on a stage, and there are a couple of different reasons why, the, why I think the author chose to set this on the stage. First of all, 
it's establishing that this is a troupe of Shakespearean actors. And we are on, we are basically from the perspective of the actors, which then we're, we're in the perspective of the, of the troupe throughout the rest of the book. We understand that something is wrong um, because there's these little hints that King stumbled. He was 51 years old. Um, we have this, this picture of this gentleman with maybe flowers and he's going mad, but then there's a real life heart attack. Um, and this is something that then leads into a, an entire scene where um, Arthur passes on the stage. And you might think, well, where's the post-apocalypse? The post-apocalypse comes at the end of this first chapter, or at least the hints. So this is not a book where it's like, oh, look at the zombies right from page one. But it is a book that in kind of captures our attention around the actors in the troupe. Um, this is a, a close-knit group of people, as many theater companies are. They are um, people who maybe spend their world lives not doing the same thing as other people. Um, but when King Lear dies, and especially if you enjoy Shakespeare, this is um, kind of cool. N not cool that he dies, of course. Um, but King Lear dies, it interrupts the action on the stage. And then that leads the reader into um, kind of learning more about each of the characters. And then at the end of the chapter, and I'm just going to, to flip it ahead here. Ah, here we go. Um, hang on. All right, so we're uh, at the end of chapter two, which is where they're, they're kind of sitting around talking about how to contact Arthur's family and what the next steps are um, and having a drink. Um, of all of them there at the bar that night, the bartender was the one who survived the longest. He died three weeks later on the road out of the city. So it takes a little bit longer to get to what you might consider the action of the book or the, the, the main conflict of the book, um, which is the apocalypse. But it... Th the book does set, I mean, it spends some time getting to know the people. Um, one of the one of the folks who respond to the heart attack is a paramedic who we see later on. Um, so in this, we're not necessarily jumping straight into like a commercial genre fiction book. Instead, it takes a little bit of time introducing us to the world and setting up this idea of action taking place on a stage, which then continues throughout the book, even though they are a Shakespeare troupe in post-apocalyptic time. Um, like I said, there's a little bit of difference between upmarket fiction and commercial fiction. And most, um, if you were trying to sell this as commercial fiction, you might get some feedback on, why are you starting here? Why don't you start in the middle of the action? Um, but I think that if you take a look at that, if you take a look at opening up on this, uh, how um, Emily St. John Mandel opens up on the stage, puts us into this kind of eerie play that then becomes very real life, which then devolves into this vision of a post-apocalyptic future. So she kind of leads us from fantasy to real life and then we head back into a fantasy of what real life is going to be like. Um, so yeah, so there's another way to approach opening your book. But again, she doesn't necessarily have to tell us much more than what she does in order to hook our attention and show us what's happening in the book. Um, also, I really recommend that book. It's a lot of fun. So finally, this book, Upstate by James Wood, this is straight up literary fiction. And um, as far as plot goes, it's not that plotty of a book. It's, I shouldn't say plotty, it sounds like I'm saying plotting. Um, but it's, it's not plot focused, it's more character focused, but things are happening. And the very first paragraph gives us a hint 
of what this book is going to be about. Um, so he says, first, he would have to go and see his mother. He would tell her something about Vanessa, not everything, of course. The home six miles along a favorite road was a formidable old place with that gray strictness of the north he loved, but now it looked abandoned. Four years she had been living there, and he was still never sure how to announce himself. It was also ridiculously expensive. He could no longer afford it. So reading this book um, tells me two things. One, this protagonist um, is going to be having some family issues later on. And indeed, the entire book is, it's basically a family drama. Um, and it's a pretty compelling family genre, uh, family drama, um, especially if you have faced having to deal with things like, oh, geez, um, ailing parents, how to afford health care, um, how to be a parent of adult children. And all of that is hinted at in this very first um, paragraph. Vanessa is the protagonist's daughter who's moved to America. Um, and we don't know right off the bat if she's his daughter or if she's his spouse or something like that. We do find out later, but we know that he has somebody named Melissa or named Vanessa. Something has happened and he doesn't know how to tell his mother about it. Um, but we also then realize that his mother is living in some sort of assisted living. And so that raises a bunch of other questions. Again, the, it's, it's an opening that gives us something to chew on, something to turn around in our mind. Doesn't necessarily tell us everything about what's going on, but is concise and spare and descriptive enough to have us keep reading. Now for each of these openings, they each fall into different genres, so to speak. We've got um, literary fiction, a family drama. We have upmarket fiction, which is a post-apocalyptic um, vision of an acting troupe. And then we have our commercial fiction with uh, military urban fantasy. Each of the, each, when you approach reading in each of these genres, each reader is going to have different expectations. Um, if we're writing a literary family genre and we're marketing to literary fiction readers, there's an expectation that we might not necessarily open up on an action filled sequence, but there's going to be something there that is going to echo throughout the book, as, um, as is true in Upstate. We are led through. Um, a lot of these intricate family obligations and feelings. Um, a lot of the book takes place in the characters' re relationships and conversations, and a lot takes place in our protagonist's head. Um, and there's another thing too, is in that opening paragraph, he's describing the furnishings of the room. He talks about the fact that his mother has two rooms and one of them is specifically for her old, dark, heavy furniture. Later on in the book, as he's describing the other places that they go to and that his daughter is living in, um, he does spend some time describing the, the furniture and the surroundings. Um, and as you are reading, it does take a bit of patience, but it relates back to how people create their own environments and how they, how they create places that they, they either feel comfortable in or that they're supposed to feel comfortable in. And it's only after reading the book that you realize that's what the author is doing in that very first opening. But it is a reoccurring theme. And the same thing with um, Station Eleven. We are, as we head into the post-apocalyptic world, it might be tempting to ask, why is this? Why are these first two chapters so set in this Shakespearean performance? where we find out that everybody except like two people that we meet in those first, you know, 12 dozen some odd pages, only like two of the people that we initially meet end up surviving. Well, it's a po book about post-apocalyptic post Shakespeare troupe opening on a Shakespearean scene with Shakespearean actors um, showing what was, what used to be, what the status quo was is important because it informs the choices that these characters make later. It affects who they are in the future. 
um, one of the protagonists is one of the little girls that was playing on this, was playing one of King Lear's daughters on the stage. And that, um, and now she's basically part of this troupe and bringing Shakespeare to the people living in this wasteland. And it asks questions. It, it's, it, it's a book that you read and then you think about. Um, and it's all set up right there at that beginning. Um, and then of course, Mike Cole's book, which is so excellent. Um, it gets us right into the action. It throws these questions at us right from the beginning and basically dares us to stop reading before we find out what's going on. And I did not accept that dare. I kept reading because I did want to find out um, what the choices were. And then I went on to read the next two books in the series. So that was pretty cool too. Anyway, uh, talking about starting, talking about beginnings, we talked about um, intro um, hook or intro problem and attack in Chuck Wendig's book. We talked about beginnings being made up of hooks and builds and payoffs, um, as well as, you know, the entire book being hook, build and payoff. Uh, we talked about the first five pages. Uh, we talked about maybe not opening your book with a scene where a character wakes up. Uh, we looked at three books and the opening scenes in each. Um, and then we talked about an exercise to either write or rewrite the beginning of your story. Um, if it's a short story, take your 300 words and condense your intro into 300 words. Um, if it's a novel, see if you can condense that introduction into a flash fiction piece. In fact, think about writing a flash fiction piece as a way to get into your story. Um, and then, let me see, so exercises books, everything. Um, and then uh, I would also challenge you to go ahead and depending on what you're working on, um, whether it's speculative fiction or sports fiction or a memoir or something like that, um, take a look at, go down to your local bookstore or um, use the Amazon look inside feature and take a look at the first paragraph or two of books that are similar to the ones that you're writing and try to break them down to see how they show the hook, how they show a problem, um, how they show that inciting incident if you get to it in time. And you know, when if, after you've read a couple of these, see if there are any common themes between them. Um, and you can do this for, like I said, for upmarket fiction, for literary fiction, for genre fiction, um, even for nonfiction, like we talked about Chuck Wendig's um, introduction. All of those things are super helpful. At the end of the day, though, the thing that will um, continue to help you improve and get better at starting at, at beginnings is to um, write them, uh, to both critique and edit them, and then to write them. So um, sometimes writing and critiquing and writing and critiquing um, can also help. So I am going to just do a quick look and if it is 1117, which means I've been talking for quite some time and I uh, probably should uh, stop and get back to writing, um, which my own thing, which is a little bit overdue. So yeah, so if you are um, taking a look at this, even if it's a couple of weeks from now, a couple of months from now, whenever, if you've got a question, if there's something you want to explore further, just drop me a comment, drop me a question, and uh, I'll hook it up for a future, a future live stream or maybe a future blog post. Um, I've got planned for this next month, um, I've got a couple of reviews. There's some books that I just recently got. One is called Writing uh, Business Essentials for Writers by James Nettles, which I'm gonna take a look at and maybe do a little blog post review. Uh, I've got some flash fiction that I've been working on that I'll be sharing. Um, and I've got a couple, like I said, a couple of other books that I've purchased um, to, uh, writing focused books that I've purchased that I'll be doing reviews of, so. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, happy writing.